One of the most fascinating stories in the Old Testament is found in the book of Esther. Um, Esther is one of those stories that just reads like a, a movie script out of Hollywood. It has a, a protagonist, an antagonist. It has a beautiful heroine. Um, it has um, great drama and uh, some ironic twists. You may know the story really well, but there's a phrase in the book of Esther that comes to mind when I think about our circumstances here at Williams. And it's a simple phrase for such a time as this. Uh, if you've done much reading of that uh, book in the Old Testament, uh, you know that it's a, a story about a, a people who were in dire straits. Uh, just to set the stage a little bit, the king, uh, this Persian king, uh, Ahusserus, uh, probably Xerxes the first, um, was living on a on a high. Things were going really well for him, so much so that he decided to throw this amazing party. I'm going to read you a few verses from chapter one. If you have it, read the story. Read the book of Esther. This happened in the days of Ahusserus, the same Ahusserus who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days, when the king sat on his royal throne in the citadel of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and ministers. The army of, Mer of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were present. While he displayed the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and pomp of his majesty for many days, 180 days in all. That's some party. Uh, and it was a me party. Look at me. Look how great I am. Look at all I've accomplished. He was very proud of himself. He wanted everybody to know it. So he was living uh, the high life. And this party went on and on. And finally, he had just about exhausted every form of entertainment they could, could not come up with. Uh, so he decided to um, bring his queen uh, before this assembled mass of men, uh, and he wanted to show her off. Now, it's not absolutely clear in the text, but a number of scholars have suggested that when the king wanted the queen to appear wearing her royal crown, uh, what that really meant was he wanted her to appear wearing the royal crown and nothing else. To her credit, uh, Vashti uh, refused to be uh, a sexual object uh, refused to be humiliated, refused to be just used for the pleasure of these drunks uh, who by this time, um, again, had found every other form of entertainment and thought this would be the crowning uh, moment. Uh, she has much to be admired, and she's one who um, pays a price. She's banished. She's not allowed ever to come into the presence of the king again. Um, and she's just put out to pasture. Well, in the process of all that, it's really interesting. And again, I hope you'll read this story. But in chapter one, um, the advisors to the king say, listen, this is trouble because the word gets out that your wife has disobeyed you. That means all the other women in this empire will do the same thing. <laughs> so they, they send out a letter to the various provinces in this widespread empire. Um, and in verse uh, 21 and 22, uh, the king is pleased with this advice. So they sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, to every people in its own language, declaring that every man should be master in his own house. So, guys, I guess um, this what this says is you have permission to be the master in your own house. But if you're smart, you make sure you get your wife's permission to be the master in your own house. Well, as the story continues... The king, uh, looking around, he didn't have a queen any longer. So they decide to hold a royal beauty pageant. And that's where we are introduced to this young Jewish girl. The Jews have been in exile since the days of Nebuchadnezzar. They had been uh, cut off from their country and were uh, living in exile and um, lived um, as a community. But obviously they were a long way from home and um, life was not so easy. There was a man named Mordecai who was respected. He had risen to some positions of, of authority um, in the province, and um, 
he he um, had taken on this young Jewish girl. She was a relative. Uh, her parents were not living, and he chose to raise her as his own daughter. And he um, was certainly concerned about her. Um, he knew how beautiful she was, and he knew that there was this this empire wide search for the most beautiful women uh, to bring before the king, so he could choose his new queen. Well, as as it uh, so happened, uh, she is selected. She is sent to um, the king's harem. And there she is uh, trained along with these other young women in all things um, beauty, um, all the best dresses, all the things that you could imagine a young woman would uh, would want to wear to be treated um, so that she could appear at her very best. Uh, her best was good enough, so much so that the king uh, ends up choosing her to be his new queen. Now, before all this uh, transpires, Mordecai has taken her aside. Her Hebrew name was Hadassah, uh, and her Persian name was Esther. Uh, he had taken her aside and said, now listen, uh, don't let him, let him know that you're one of the exiles. Don't let him know you're Jewish. And she's able to keep that from him. Well, there's another person in the story who is the villain. His name is Haman. And if you know the story very much, you know he personifies all the bad guys you've ever seen on screen uh, or read about in stories. But Haman um, has a real high opinion of himself and has worked his way up to become prime minister. And as prime minister, he wants everybody to bounce great. And Mordecai, who is a lesser official, refuses to do so, which makes Haman furious. So Haman decides that the best thing to do with a guy like Mordecai is to wipe him and all his kind out. The Jewish people have known for centuries um, oppression. They've known persecution. Um, and for this story, as it unfolds, it looks like yet another way for uh, the people of Israel to be uh, barbarically treated. Well, I can't keep going on because I'll take too long, but um, Mordecai does find out about a plot to assassinate the king and uh, sends word to the now new queen, Esther, who warns her husband that there is this plot. So the king remembers that, writes it down in the book of records uh, that Mordecai had, had worked to his favor. Well, Haman, who's still, still burning with contempt, um, wants to do away with Mordecai. Um, and they know it. They know he's up to no good. So he begins to manage to maneuver and uh, ends up being in a position where he can issue orders that all the Jews are to be exterminated. Well, it's at that point again that we get to the place where Mordecai, who's aware of the danger, um, goes to um, Esther and says, Esther, this, this is one of those moments where you can, you can stand up um, you can risk, you can choose to live um, in such a way that uh, you're willing to be brave, courageous, but you can't stay silent. For the, you have been put in this place for such a time as this. And if you know the story again, you know that uh, Esther is able to go to the king and risks even um, seeking an audience with him. Um, he has the right to put her to death if he chooses to, but of course he's enamored with his new queen. And when she appears before him, um, he grants her a request. And the request is uh, to hold a banquet in his honor and to invite Haman. Well, this happens a couple of times. And finally, Esther, in one of those appearances, tells the king that there is someone who is working to do him ill as well as a people who do not deserve to be um, mistreated. And it come to find out that Haman has ordered the extermination of the Jews. But on the very day that he's ordered that extermination, he is revealed as the true villain that he is. And um, as he tries to plead with, with Esther while the king is out on the balcony, fuming about this, this uh, intrigue, the king comes back in and there's Haman trying to to beg the, the queen to 
to give him aid. And in the process, it appears that he's actually physically assaulting Esther. Well, that seals his fate. So on the very day that he was to exterminate the Jews, he himself is um, put on the gallows and his life is forfeit. What does all this mean? Well, it's interesting if you read the whole book, and you should, because it's a great story, and I've rushed through it, um, you'll not see the name of God anywhere in the book. And yet you cannot help but feel that there is something guiding, someone um, providing in this circumstance. The Jews certainly felt that way and established the Feast of Purim, which is a reminder of how they were saved in a moment of great danger. I doubt that you'll ever be in the same kind of circumstance that Esther faced. But in your home, in your business, in your school, in other settings, you may have to stand up. You may have to risk. You may may have to act in courage in doing the right thing at the right time. And know this, as Esther discovered, and so many others have, that in doing the right thing, you'll have the strength and the wisdom of the Lord to encourage you, to strengthen you. Maybe that'll happen these next few days for such a time as this. You might be just the person. Bless you.